Afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the session with uh, Charles and Alan. Um, so we're, we're going to have a bit of discussion about uh, implementing uh, change, basically. Um, so from my personal story, uh, I'm a, a, a farmer down in um, Hampshire. Uh, in 2011, I did a Nuffield scholarship. I came back and um, changed the farm, introduced grass, herbal lays, and, uh, and into the cropping rotation, running sheep in, uh, in sort of bigger groups. And, um, and now we're into a mobile milking system, mobile milking parlor moving around the, the grazing platform. So we're into a four-year herbal lay rotation and then four years of crops and have just gone into uh, organic crop production. Um, so that's kind of a, a bit of a background. And um, I'm going to sit down now. So I'm, I'm really uh, pleased to be with, with these two um, gentlemen that have sort of brought us some really great stories as to what the future could look like. And it was something that I was, was sold on when I, when I studied holistic management, and I did a holistic management course in 2013, and I went, under the, went through the, uh, the journey of, of trying to transform my farm into uh, becoming more holistically managed. And um, I, I kind of feel the thing that we haven't talked about in, uh, in all these stories is the early years. So we get really excited and passionate about changing, and we can see the great stories that the two of you have spoken about. Um, but there's, there's very often, the, in the first sort of five years, after the initial inertia and excitement, uh, it can all go a bit, a bit wrong. Um, and I, I just thought it'd be great to hear from you two. I mean, especially Alan, you, know, you were battling against some pretty um, hardened minds when it came to introducing the changes that you wanted to introduce into uh, um, Rhodesia. Um, how did you, well, what were the challenges you faced and how did you deal with it? And the same, Charles, you know, we'll hear from you in a minute. And, and you, you uh, presumably have seen some amazing stories where people have, have, they're doing fine now, but they've gone through some hardship to get there. And it'd be great to hear that hardship and, and you know, what it can be really like. <laughs> Go on, Charles. I'll defer to Alan's request, and it's an honour to be with you, Alan. Uh, and thanks, Tim. Uh, I guess in Australia we call an expert a drip under pressure, and um, I'm an expert on making mistakes, and that's a bit where all my major learning has come from. So. Uh, we were a traditional grazing operation and as I mentioned in my talk yesterday, it was a five year drought in the early 1980s when I, uh, I saw my resource, we had a, a, a merino genetic business, uh, a major income, selling three or four hundred rams across Australia. And I saw that as the one I had to defend and I ignored the landscape because I didn't understand ecological literacy. So that was my first big lesson. We ended up with a big, doubt, uh, big debt and really damaged our landscape. Uh, and there was no holistic management uh, approaches around at the time, even though I'd trained in the early 70s in the first course in Australia on holistic thinking. There was nothing like that at the time. And, so I didn't really do my first course until uh, 1993, 94. And as you often do in that situation, the light bulbs come on and you rush in with great enthusiasm. And uh, so I made all the classic mistakes you make at that, in that process. I raced around building water infrastructure in the wrong places, which caused erosion because it wasn't well designed. Um, put fences in the wrong place, um, was running uh, two or three thousand sheep in a mob and didn't spend the time of quiet stock handling to get them. So I, I damaged a lot of fences. Um, so that, that was a catalogue of mistakes I learned from uh, and I, I really wasn't executing the decision making process, particularly key questions like what's your weak link? which is one of the great things I got out of the savoury course. Uh, eventually I learned from that uh, because they're hard lessons and they cost money. Uh, I think the hardest thing in, from what I've seen in cropping is when you switch over 
it takes, depending on where you are, quite a few years to get the soil health going and the ecology going and the diversity coming. And so you, you can expect a depression in production, especially if you're also investing in infrastructure, and that can really challenge the nerves and the faith. Uh, but eventually, if you're executing it, that will come. But there can be a trough, and uh, there can certainly be a trough if you make the mistakes that I made. And my second big mistake was I still tried to run a merino stud. Uh, so I was sort of in this halfway house. We, we couldn't ignore the income because of a bit of a debt from the drought. And so I didn't make the full switch for another eight or nine years to full devotion to ecology and the landscape. So that would summarise some of the many mistakes I've made, I think. And, and you would have met, Charles, some, some guys in, in your research that sort of have gone through the same thing, have felt very lonely, very isolated, emotionally drained in, the, in those early years. What, what were their sort of coping strategies? I think the big challenge, particularly more so back in the 90s and 2000 when these ideas were being spread, was it was, uh, it was very lonely. Our district is very conservative. Uh, it's, there may be a thousand farmers and there's about eight of us doing this. And um, I, I do quote Alan in my book about the challenge of being an early adopter or an innovator. There's this hundred mile barrier of being an adopter or follower in your own district. It's easier to go outside the district and bring a new idea in and be seen as an innovator. So it's lonely, it's challenging. You have to put up with um, not quite total but, uh, social exclusion, but uh, you are challenging powerful paradigms in farming and, in, and even in the social world. So that's, and it can be lonely. And um, the benefit is of groups like HM, et cetera, and or if it's agroforestry or the other groups, you have a community of practice. And that gives you a support network. It gives you exemplars. You've obviously got a founding book and the key ideas. And, and I think that is the big safety valve that there is this support of, it may not be your own community, but there's a community of practice. And, and that, uh, with good mentoring, can be a huge help in the shift. I don't know, you got me casting my mind back to your original question to the beginning. Uh, it can get lonely. Uh, as we used to say, the banana that leaves the bunch gets skinned. <laughs> um, and nobody warned me as a bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, young uh, scientist leaving university um, nobody warned me that the greatest crime you can commit is to actually discover something new. The rest of your life will be a fight and a struggle. Uh, and that's been the case for, for everybody who's ever done so. Um, so it's, it's long. Uh, the, uh, I think the word, I, I've been asked often, how did I keep going when I was struggling on so many fronts? I was struggling militarily with new thinking, mm -hmm. politically with new thinking, scientifically with new thinking. I was just changing caps um, because poor land means poor people, social upheaval, war at the end of it. And so I was <coughs> living with that. Uh, and uh, many people, that would be many different jobs. But for me, I was just changing the cap, whether I was fighting one day in Parliament the next day, back working with uh, people as a consultant the next day, or back on my own farms or ranches. Um, the, a person who, who um, summed it up for me early was uh, Frank Fraser Darling, the Scottish ecologist. He got knighted later, but when I knew him, we just called him FD, and he spent six weeks with me when I was 20 years old. Uh, in Africa, and uh, I took him around the Banguelo swamps and various areas, and I must have bored him to tears, because one night in camp in the Mwero Antipa, he said to me, Alan, why don't you shut up? <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, he was a much older man, and I said, well, an FD, uh, I'm not going to shut up. This is my country. Uh, when I see soil eroding like this, land deteriorating, like this, there's no way I'm ever going to shut up. Um, 
uh, I'm going to keep fighting to do something about it. And he said, you may not believe me now, but you only have two options ahead of you. And I said, what are those? And he said, you'll either go back to university, do your research, publish your papers, and not care whether anything is ever done, or you will go into politics. And I said, I will never go back to academic life. Uh, uh, it's not for me. And I said, I will never go into politics. I hate the bastards, they're crooked, and so on. <laughs> Typical immature young man's comments. Yeah. And years later, I was coming back from hawking up in Scotland with friends of mine, Falconer friends, and called on FD to have tea. And I s said to him, uh, do you remember a night in Awero and telling me that? And he did vaguely. And I said, you were right. <laughs> I said, I'm now leading the opposition. I'm now president of the Rhodesia party yeah. <laughs> in politics, because I literally had to go yeah. into politics even to try to get the ideas over. And uh, so I have a long history of failures. In fact, uh, one former minister rang me up one, one day to congratulate me, and I said, what the hell are you congratulating me on? He said, you've just become the most defeated man in the history of the country. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, it's not a pleasure I wanted. So, so I, think, I think I hold many records like that. Uh, one that amuses me, I think I'm the only member ever uh, blackballed from the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association in the history of the Commonwealth. I was blackballed by my own country, and the Cayman Islands put me in. Oh. So it just becomes a long, lonely struggle. But I have uh, been asked, what keeps you going when you do have such opposition uh, as I've had with whole governments trying to crush it, forcing me into exile? Um, I, I, went, I want to go on with the list. It's a mm. long list of incredible uh, stuff, including banning me from setting foot on any campus of any university for over 20 years and whole of Southern Africa, um, etc. Whole farming districts being advised, all government aid subsidy would be withdrawn from every farmer if a farmer even invited me to talk in a private home. I mean, incredible pressures to crush the thinking. And when I think of what does keep you going, I have only been able to come back to one thing, care. If you care enough about your family, your nation, your community, you will do whatever you have to do no matter what the cost, including giving your life, if you care enough. If you don't care enough, you become part of the apathetic crowd. and You just go with the apathetic crowd. If you care enough, you'll do whatever you have to do. So I, I bring it down to one word, care. Yeah, yeah see, so I've, uh, since I've been going down this journey, I've now had you know, various sort of farmers and managers and stuff come to see me and say, you know, what are you doing? Uh, how could I do this on my business? And I, I kind of get a feeling that some of them will succeed and some of them won't. And it seems that they're probably, if they don't own the problem, then it's not going to work. Is that a sort of feeling? Do you, do, I mean, do you get a feeling when you meet people that it's not worth them starting on the journey until they've got certain things in place? Or, you know, is, is there you know, some advice or some, some key indicators or, or some key character traits or situations that you'd say, yeah, you're ready to start making a change and do stuff, or do you understand what I'm saying? I, I, I think I understand what you're saying, but, <clears throat> you know, I don't think anybody solved that problem. One of the people I think came closest to explaining it is uh, the fellow who wrote The Path of Least Resistance, uh, Robert, what, what was his name? Did any of you remember the path of least, Robert Fritz, something like that, right. something like that. And he said, we humans at any given moment take the path of least resistance. Your hand touches a hot stove, you pull it away, and we're like that. And um, that seems to come close to it, because what is hard to understand is if any of us want to live longer and healthier lives, really the, you've just got to eat less and exercise more. There's multi-billion dollar industries selling, riding bicycle machines for the home, rowing machines, running shoes. It's a multi, multi-billion dollar industry. People make good New Year's resolutions. How many do it? You explain that one to me, 
and then you'll also explain why people can come, do a week of training on holistic management, learn how others have done that when they were facing bankruptcy on their farms, learned how to do holistic planned grazing, and have made 300% more profit in the first year back on the farm. Nothing, no mob grazing, no other thing has ever done that. That is a published paper. And I thought when a paper like that is published, of, of a study of the earlier adopters across the whole of the United States, I thought every farmer will latch on to that. Because over the same time period as that study was done, 600,000 American farmers went bankrupt and suicide was the leading cause of death. Wouldn't you think if you guys read, if you were facing that situation and you read of people who'd done a week of training in a new way of thinking and they averaged 300% profit in those same markets, wouldn't you think everybody would do it? Almost nobody did. And, and, and Charles, the paper sorry. is hardly ever cited by any opponents or anyone. Mm. So I don't understand these things you any more than you do. Charles, would you, have you uh, seen situations where you'd say to someone, they're not ready yet to change? So, and, and what sort of people are they? What sort of situations are they in? Uh, the answer is yes. <clears throat> I, I know what we're talking about is the power of paradigms, that worldview. Um, before I swung over to holistic grazing, we, we developed a merino, different sort of merino sheep, uh, animal welfare friendly, very efficient, beautiful fibre, working with molecular genetics. So it was a huge challenge to the scientific establishment and the, the invested um, genetics industry. And uh, so we ran workshops every year and I, I just knew that some farmers would turn up 10 years in a row and still couldn't get it. Others would get it first year. It's a really intriguing area and I, um, part of what led to my book was going across Australia and the world and, and privileged of staying on Dimbang Gombe with Alan and Jody. And um, so I interviewed 80 what I saw as leading regenerative farmers and my question was what made your transformative shift? When I analysed the interviews, in about 60% of the cases, it was a major life shock that had cracked, if you like, the carapace of their mind open. Droughts, uh, animal health crisis, uh, bushfire, animal disease or whatever. And the other 40% of the cases, maybe they were more inclined. And um, I, I remember the first time, um, just after I'd met Alan, we were on a stage in um, South Africa at a university or, or a conference about 500 people and right in the back corner there were these four guys in suits with their arms crossed. Um, and as soon as Alan had finished his keynote speech, up they pop with aggressive questions. It would have been the rangeland scientists, I think, who have been challenged by Alan through all his work, as I understand, because they believe if you lock a brittle country up in a national park, it'll self-heal. Well, it doesn't. and so. That to me epitomised what a challenge and holistic revolutionary approach is to the scientific fraternity and, and to we farmers. And um, it's how you crack through that paradigm is, is part of the hub of this, this whole issue. So, so they've got to be, you, they've got to be open to, the, the paradigm's got to be open to being shift effectively is what you're saying before they're, they're, it's worth them going down the route of, of changing. And, and some people are more that way inclined and also a lot of our education is more reductionist. You know, there's not much true teaching of a, a true holistic approach, which was another part of uh, Alan's work and uh, it came out of Smuts's great book in the, in the 20s, Holism and Evolution. And, and it, is a, it is a challenge because it's, we're just not taught to um, see, try and see all the pictures of the puzzle that that can... The sum of the parts is actually greater than those parts. That, that sort of idea of self-organising systems and uh, rather than a reductionist approach with, uh, if you like, um, simplistic solutions to it. So it's, yeah. I'm telling this guy to suck eggs, but it's, it's, <laughs> it's not a simple process. Yeah. Um, Alan, um, 
just moving on, so this morning we were talking about um, restoring land, um, and you were particularly talking about um, desertified land. Um, but obviously in the UK we haven't got deserts, but we've got degraded soil. Um, and the grazing strategies in our sort of less brittle environment, what, what sort of activities should we be focusing on more or less for us in our non-brittle environment than, than the stuff that we worked on this morning in the more brittle environment? Absolutely no difference. Absolutely no difference. All you need to do is manage holistically. And that's identical whether you're working as a single person in a town, not having any land, just managing your life, or if you're a big company, or if you're a farmer anywhere in the world, we're talking about management, all management, from the family to governance. It is reductionist. Everybody managing reduces the social, the cultural, the economic complexity to meeting a need, a desire, or solving a problem. That is reductionist. All we need to do is anybody and anywhere is develop a holistic context of how you want your life to be tied to your life-supporting environment and let that be the context or reason for your actions. Now, you might do it very imperfectly. It doesn't matter. Your life will begin to improve because you're beginning to manage holistically and then you'll get better and better at it as you go. And we are doing it far from perfectly and I do it far from perfectly, but you can see the results, etc. And I've had just, a, let, let me give you a simple example so that you see it is just decision making. We were training uh, farm families, etc. Many of them came just like you said because they were broke uh, facing it. We had a young couple in training. I really liked them, nice young couple. I knew they were deeply in trouble. And then about a month later, the, our staff uh, told me when I came into the office, they said, Jack and Jill, let's call them, uh, have lost the farm, they've sold the farm. And I thought, oh, damn it, we didn't catch them in time. Because we can save almost any farm if they just change the management. And I was so disappointed. And then I saw grins on some of the staff faces. I said, what are you doing? What, what's, what's going on? And they said, no, they chose to sell the farm. They were managing holistically. When they got home, as a young couple, they developed a holistic context. How did they want their lives to be? And went on with that, and when they did that, it's deep stuff, that's the hardest thing you have to do. Everything after that is easy. When they did that, they realized they didn't want to be farming. They were farming because the family expected them to. It was a family inheritance. So they realized the only honest thing to do was to call the family together sit with the family and say, which of you want to farm? We don't. None of the family wanted a farm, so they took the decision to sell the farm. That saved a marriage, saved a family, prevented another damn divorce and upset life. That is holistic management. It's not about cattle or sheep. Those are a tool. And you can do this in any walk of life. So that's where you begin. Now, when you do that and you come to cattle, on this land versus Africa or anywhere, the holistic plan grazing works anywhere, regardless of ranch size. It's just a very simple way of sorting out the confusion of orchards and crops and fields and different classes of livestock and maybe wildlife, and it sorts it out very simply for you in about an hour's work twice a year is usually what it takes, and then you just follow the plan or, or change it. Now, when you do that, you will never turn to desert here, but you will lose production. You won't see the loss of production except in your pocketbook, and you'll lose production if you're losing biodiversity, effectiveness of the rainfall, all those things that people have been talking about at this meeting. Um, it's, a, it's a little bit like when I go on land with somebody in Australia or anywhere and we're going to walk on the land and look at what's happening, I always walk to a slope if, I, if there's one. Because on a slope you will see the faults. You'll see if the water's running fast, etc. You don't see the faults 
on the flat ground. And it's a little bit like that. I talked to you this morning about the faults in the brittle environments of the world where if you're doing something wrong, it shows up quickly. Those same faults reflect here in loss of production. So you'll do all the same sort of things and you can use fencing where we, fencing is destructive for us. You can use, uh, you can use very little animal impact. You don't have to have it. We have to change the animal behavior. You can get away without changing that behavior. So it's easier for you than it is for us. But it's the same processes, the same decision making. And um, Charles, I don't think we can let you leave um, this show without addressing Roundup. Um, you've got some very um, strong views uh, and some very um, interesting science on the impact of Roundup in both the, uh, um, the ecosystem and our gut ecosystem. And I'd, can we explore that a bit more? Can you tell us a bit more about uh, your findings on Roundup? Sure. I, I just might tell an anecdote before that, because when I visited Alan and stayed with him, we went for a, a drive and a walk, Alan in bare feet, of course, following uh, the Dimbangombi River down to where it joined with the Titsangombi, isn't it? And uh, mind you, going down there was like, I was being questioned, it was like going through an HM grilling. <laughs> um, and this is just following the big uh, tropical rains where the, the vegetation in the uh, Dimbangombi River just laid down with no impact. And then we got to the junction with this other river where, whose catchment was, as I understand, similar size but traditionally grazed. And I, I might let Alan describe, it was such a powerful lesson to me about the whole process and, um, and uh, the impact of soil and water on, on the whole system. Um, or, or, or I'll jump in and finish the story then. But uh, once the Dimbangombi hit this other stream and, and with similar catchments, uh, so there's sort of maybe flood level that didn't, didn't do any damage in Dimbangombi and there's sort of, as I remember, about an eight to ten foot flood that had come down uprooting trees and stuff. It was such a classic demonstration of soil absorption in, in, in big rainfall environment. Um, yeah, so that, that was the story and, and uh, I'm, I'm not trying to dodge your question but I'll, <laughs> I'll address it. Um, and I have been trolled by one of the big multinationals for expressing views, but I did a lot of homework, so it's based on a lot of scientific uh, papers and work. There's a huge amount of evidence out there that shows that uh, uh, glyphosate is a, a dangerous chemical to both soil biology and to our gut biology and health and the environment. And I had the privilege of working um, with a woman called Kerry Gillam who published a book called Whitewash. Now she was an experienced Reuters journalist of 15 years and she was given access to what are called the poison papers, about 10,000 or more documents that had been leaked from within, I won't name the company, but one of the big companies making it, which showed uh, the capture of, of this giant company of the whole uh, regulatory process that approves chemicals in the United States, uh, cover-ups of cancer and other evidence that it was causing, uh, admittedly in rat trials and that sort of thing, but a mammalian system. And uh, she had, uh, well, probably in the thousands of, of information and backup, as well as uh, papers that have been published since, uh, into the hundreds, some of them reviewing hundreds of papers in the human physiological side. And to me, as a trained scientist, um, the evidence was just overwhelming um, that it is damaging. And it's damaging because uh, anywhere in nature which has evolved, co-evolved with its systems, particularly uh, to do with mam mam mammals or ruminants, in that system, we are co-evolved to use the nutrients, et cetera, out of that system. And you put in a, a man-made chemical, it is a high probability, because we're not adapted to it, that it, it could so cause some sort of damage. And uh, the evidence to me 
is overwhelming that um, uh, we should not be going near glyphosate. And, and I said yesterday that it could be that the silent spring to the next DDT, and I stand by that. Uh, I think the evidence is, is just too powerful. And uh, uh, many of these big court cases that have just come through are based not so much uh, on the direct evidence of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, but the corporate behaviour of that particular company in capturing the regulatory process and covering up the evidence that they were aware of. Yeah. So, I guess some of the people uh, here uh, in, and in no-till, they, they hear your, not your, but they hear this, the, the, the um, argument about Roundup. And um, they say, well, yeah, but all chemicals are going to have an impact. Um, but let's look at the greater good that we're, we're doing with, uh, with zero-till, the, the increase in worms, um, with the increase in perceived um, soil function, the greater water infiltration, all that sort of stuff. So how can Roundup be, how, so how do we square that? How do, where does it, what do we do? <laughs> yeah, I'm not saying it's simple. It, it's probably not black and white. We need a phase-in period. I, I guess uh, I'm, I'm using what's called the, the precautionary principle. If there's evidence that's telling you that there's something dangerous and potentially damaging, in time it should be phased out. And, and we now know, and I'm no crop expert, but I've seen a, a fair bit. We now know with multi-species cover cropping and some of the good biological innovations in Australia and America, alternate systems, um, that we can replace the industrial inputs with biology and um, keeping ground cover and ruminants in the system. So maybe not in every case, but um, there's enough evidence now and we're only on the cusp of this accelerating innovation. Uh, I would be confident that just for example, just say um, European community banned glyphosate in the next four years when it's due again, uh, or the court cases in America tripped the USDA and others to ban it, uh, I don't think it's going to be the end of the world. The, the alternatives are there and it may trigger a whole new innovation cycle. But, um, I'm not saying we ban it tomorrow because people are dependent on it at the moment and it needs a phase-in period. But uh, I could be called controversial, but I'm, I'm just acting on the evidence that I've really looked at. So, Alan, with your holistic management uh, head on, could, could, maybe we could go through a, a, a decision-making process about, to, to, as an example of how it could work. How could we manage without uh, a roundup? Let's, let's just have an example of, of, of that, if, if you don't mind. You'd manage perfectly easily. Don't even bother to ban it, just change the policies and farmers will stop using it in their own self-interest. Uh, you know, when you say, uh, look at the decision-making, remember that all the policies of these companies doing that, the policies of the government, right, how do they develop them? Reductionist. And we know that is the cause of global desertification and climate change. That is the biggest threat to humankind we've ever had. Just change that, change the cause, the rest will sort itself out. So if you had any nation like this developing all agriculture and agricultural companies working within the policy that was in a national holistic context, what the people of the country want, clean health, nutritious food, stable families, etc. like I read out yesterday in when I used an, uh, an example of a holistic context. When that is the context or reason for your agriculture and agricultural policies, you will find the companies themselves will stop it. They're poisoning their own children, they're poisoning their own grandchildren. The shareholders who are all making profit on poisoning everybody, they will want it stopped. It's a, it's a consequence of reductionist management. That's what you're looking at. So you would find very quickly, the moment any nation manages holistically in the interests of the people of the nation, right? you'll find that things like feedlots, these big feedlots with animals, will be illegal. You, 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 you won't be doing them. Clearing forests in Brazil to put livestock in there, they won't be doing it. That's just stupidity. We're looking at m lots and lots of just institutional stupidity. 
that I talked about yesterday. Remember, institutions, companies, churches, all these religious organizations, universities, none of them behave like a human being behaves. Heed the research. There's good research that shows that. These are wicked problems we're talking about. So if you want those things solved, I, do you ever hear me arguing about these chemicals? Do you ever hear me arguing about carbon in the soil and things like this? I don't. I just keep focusing on what matters, address the cause. Because if we keep arguing practices, we will be arguing practices for the next hundred years. The youth of today don't enjoy the luxury of another hundred years of such institutional stupidity. That's where I would say to you, just focus on one thing that nobody can argue against. No university can argue against you. No scientist can argue about it. Just start insisting that your policies in major environmental organizations, government, etc., be developed holistically in a national holistic context. And all of these things we're arguing about will fall aside. That will happen because you'll be addressing the cause. And until you address the cause of a problem, you have no hope of solving it. So as long as you start, keep on addressing and arguing the symptoms, the chemicals we're producing, the bad practices in mainstream agriculture, blah, 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 you'll just have argument amongst people while we're all continuing to cause the problem. We're all continuing to cause it until we change. I hope that helps. It doesn't just confuse. I, I think it helps. I think it, it, it sort of brings home to me the, um, the importance of understanding what our own holistic context is and our, our own sort of Depends which language and which from where you call it, whether it's holistic manage, uh, holistic context, vision, mission, statement, whatever it is. But but um, well, I think knowing where it is you're trying to go and what you want out of life is is so important personally and as you say institutionally and, and, and everything else. Um, trying actually trying to get that down on paper or it, I found personally I found that to be a huge challenge to try and well even work out who it is I should be consulting with to to get that holistic context for our own business and our own sort of way of life, and then getting other people to actually see that that's uh, an important um, feature that needs, needs to exist in their lives. And, and, and I've, I've found that to be a massive challenge, personally. Um, so, so why I believe in it, and, and, and yeah, we, should, we must have a, uh, a holistic context written down or a goal written down, um, then trying to get uh, the group of people around me to, to get on board with that. Like that's, been my massive sticking point. Yeah, don't, don't confuse um, a holistic context with a goal. Don't confuse it with a mission or a vision, because it's not. Uh, we've had missions and visions and goals for centuries, all right? Uh, as I said yesterday, when you develop the holistic context, it's a context for your actions, not a goal. It's a context. It's a new concept. That's what makes it new. It's not in any branch of science. It's not in any branch of philosophy. It's not in any uh, religion in the world. It, what, we didn't know what we were looking for. We couldn't get consistent results. We were getting inconsistent results. And bit by bit, while I was working with 2,000 scientists over a two-year period, bit by bit, it fell into place until we had the holistic context idea and then we could guarantee results and get consistency. So none of us knew what we were looking for even. We were just trying to learn how to manage complexity. If you read Rebecca Costa's book, The Night Watchman's Rattle, she describes how past civilizations failed not just because of their agriculture, but because their societies could not deal with the complexity of rising population and deteriorating land. So they turned away from their equivalent of science 
to human sacrifice, etc., and they shelved the problems for future generations. Exactly what we're doing on a global scale today. Going to more and more religious conflicts, etc. America turning away from science even, and we're shelving these problems for future generations. So what caused failures all around the world of civilizations, we're now just repeating on a global scale. So, you know, really and truly, we just need to understand that all we need to do is address the cause. It is that simple. That just means learn how to do that. Now, if I was describing to all of you how to ride a bicycle, you've never seen a bicycle, and I'm trying to describe how to ride it, it would get more and more confusing. And the more questions you ask, the more confusing it would get. If I just had a bicycle here, and you came out, and you rode it, you'd all say, oh my God, that's common sense. The commonest reaction I've had for nearly 50 years of people learning to manage holistically is, oh my God, it's just common sense. You would all learn it so quickly if we just did it. If you just had somebody in the house or close to you who could just begin doing it. Don't talk about it, just do it. Just develop a holistic context of how you want your life to do, be and start making your life decisions in that context. And then you can learn, there are seven little questions that help you keep on track, and you can learn to assume you're wrong if it's a new action that's never been taken. Those are simple ideas. That's it. Charles, have you got a holistic context, and what, have you got some insights into that? Well, other than in, in totally agreeing with what Alan said, I guess uh, I had a, um, having done holistic training, etc., um, what led to th the book I wrote was I just thought this story was so important of what this new movement of regenerative ag. So I went back to university in my sort of late 50s, back to the same er area that was teaching holistic thinking, human ecology, way back. And um, other than being in a room of other PhDs who were in their 20s who were very fat expert on the computers, so I, I at least knew how to cut the corners better than them. But other than that, I had a lot of catching up to do and because we'd seen in the period 40 years since I'd been at university the rise of computers and electronics and then systems thinking, soft systems thinking, all those sort of things. And I really had to get my head around because I was back into the ecological area as well, um, the modern understanding of complex adaptive systems. And which has, if you want to get a bit reductionist about it, has about 12 traits or so, but a couple of them really hit me in the eye. One of them is the capacity of these complex adaptive systems, which can be a, an ecosystem or a catchment or a farm, whatever, is if, if we empower Mother Nature through empowering those landscape functions that Alan delineated, uh, we step back and empower that. Mother Nature will self-organise back to a state of health. It may not be where she was originally, but it will be a functional health. And one of the key attributes of that is this concept of complexity. And uh, being comfortable with encouraging complexity and not understanding it all, I, I think dovetails into the, the stuff that Alan is talking about. It's, it's being comfortable with enabling things and not fully understanding it all, but encouraging those, those big concepts like self-organisation and complexity. And, and to me, and, and Alan might shoot me down, but I, as a, a, what I like to think on the way to being a holistic thinker, that sort of gels for me, and um, from that then flows the principles. And if, if I could build on, on what Charles is saying, um, I'm just trying to use this as a teaching moment. Uh, be careful of thinking holistically or taking a holistic approach, all right? It's a little bit like pregnancy. Have any of you women tried to be a little bit pregnant or to take a pregnancy approach? <laughs> it doesn't work, okay? We would be arrogant if we thought we were the first people in history to think holistically. There's lots of evidence that past people did. Uh, Charles used examples of the Aborigines 
50,000 years with only stone tools and fire. So learning to manage to the best of their ability. Now, that still turned a whole continent into a firephobic vegetation. All right, so we've never had a noble savage. There hasn't been one. We have damaged the environment um, uh, throughout. Now, if we're going to look at, say, Native American Indians, apparently they tried to think seven generations ahead before they made major decisions. If you look at early societies in Africa or anywhere, they had taboos. We didn't have laws and regulations. What do you think taboos were? They were human experience to guide future generations onto what wasn't wise. So we've got lots of evidence that people were far in advance of us in thinking holistically, trying to take a holistic approach. It didn't help them. There was no noble savage. On every continent, they damaged it enormously. Why? Because at the end of the day, you have to actually make a decision. Remember I said yesterday, peeling the onion? And when you peel the onion, all tool-using animals use the same framework. So if I was to go on today, I would show you that a baboon is using exactly the same genetically embedded framework as the most sophisticated team of scientists engaged in space exploration. They're using the same framework. It's just genetically embedded in us. That is what we need to address. And uh, again, I'll stress, the easiest to just do it or to start with simple examples. Everybody's trying to complicate it too much. I've had people come through training two, three, four times, as you described. It's a paradigm. They can't get it. And if they repeated ten times, they'd never get it. I've had people come, and in the first hour, they've got it. Now, for whatever reason, I don't know what it is, but women and children grasp it much more quickly than men. Men really grapple to get it. So that's okay, just work as families. Get the women to help you in it because they're grasping it quicker than, than men. But at the end of the day, we do need to change there. And maybe just think of starting with simple examples and then saying, okay, I've got that, now I've got the paradigm, now let me add to it. So to give you another very simple example. Jody and I had a single woman, African woman, come from Zimbabwe with her son to stay with us for six months to train and then go back to Zimbabwe and start training people in a community. And she said to me one day, Alan, couldn't I do this in, in my family? And I said, of course you can. And I'll help you if you want to get started. So I sat by our, on our dining room table after one of the training sessions and I said, no, it's just you and your son, you've got a job, and that's it, you're not managing land, so develop a holistic context, and I helped her. How do you want your life to be, educating and raising your son? What will the environment have to be like genetically, clean air, clean food, you're not managing land? What will your behavior have to be, because we include that in it, if people are to employ you and you to be, people to be loyal to you, etc and there's zero how to do it, no prejudice allowed, it is a new concept. She got it, and I said, now, just begin making your choices in life and everything towards that. And about a month later, she came to me so excited. She said, damn it, this works. And I said, what happened? And she said, I took my son, we went to the supermarket shopping, I had my shopping list, we went around with one of these carts, we filled it with all the things I, I wanted, it was on my list, I got to the checkout counter and there were six people ahead of me and she said, I had to wait. While I was waiting, she said, I thought of my context for my life and with my son. And she said, I looked at my shopping list and I saw need, need, desire, desire, need, need, desire. She said, I sheepishly went back and put half of it back on the shelves. We didn't need it, didn't really desire it more than I desired this way of life. That is holistic management. And she was as excited as can be. So just begin as simply as that. And then say, okay, now I've got the idea. Now let me go a little further and get some training and so on. Or start some self-help training. But it literally, remember, you can't be a little bit pregnant. You 
taking a holistic approach isn't going to help. Thinking holistically isn't going to help. It might be great, but end of the day, the rubber hits the road where you make decisions. Any level of management, from the family to governance. I wouldn't even dream of being back in politics without holistic management. Wouldn't dream of it. There's not a single politician that knows what to do in managing any policies. Terror, drugs, weeds, you name it. They don't know what to do. Thank you. Um, I've, just, I've got one more question, and then I promise we'll go out, out onto, the, uh, onto the floor and, and see what else we can come up with. But um, So between now and when you wrote your last book, and same as you, Charles, are, are there any conclusions that you would uh, alter or that you'd remake um, that you'd like to, to tell us about? Well, I, I did make you go first, so I'll have to this time. <laughs> I, I don't know how to answer that. Just like Charles, my greatest learnings never came from what I did right. They came from my biggest mistakes, so I don't fear mistakes any longer. Um, the, the more I learn, I'm learning like you are every, every day, um, and the more I learn, the, the more I'm learning to simplify. Uh, I think that's typical of almost anything. You develop something, and it's way too complex, and then as you understand it better and better, you're able to simplify more. And so the new book is simpler than the early ones. And if I lived, which is unlikely to write another book, I, it would be even simpler. Uh, I've often told people about an experience that impacted me. I was a little boy of about 10. I was in Bulawayo in Rhodesia at the swimming gala. And we'd all gone to the swimming gala. And there was, before the, the event started, there was a clown up on the high diving board and he had a rugby jersey on and a, one big boot and a bare foot with a sock on it. And he was drunk and tumbling around the board. And then he'd fall off the board and hit the water. And I was doing this and thinking, man, this bugger's going to break his arm or his neck. And the little boy next to me nudged me and said, what's your trouble? And I said, this bugger's going to break his neck. He said, no, he's not. He's the Rhodesian diving champion. <laughs> that sunk in with me as a little boy that when you are the country's diving champion, you can clown around. And I'm beginning to clown around. <laughs> <laughs> Charles? Yeah, I'm not to the stage I can clown around yet. Um, the only comment I would make is that the more I attend conferences like this and interact with people like Alan, etc., th this space is just opening up. Um, this regenerative agri agriculture movement, this, you know, the book I've just written, you could write it all over again with new stories. It's just happening so fast. And, and then we need to think through that um, simplifying complexity is, is also part of that process. It's pick up on Alan's point. I know that sounds philosophical, but um, instead of being daunted by everything you have to do, if you simplify it down to the principles, uh, you drive it so much better. Yeah. Thank you. So we've got some questions. Here's one. Uh, have we got any mics? We can take one of these. <laughs> Thank you. Just uh, grey shirts. Thank you very much for your wise words. Um, this question relates to some advice on storytelling. Um, and it's storytelling to help clear up uh, some of the confusion and increasing, I think, polarization that exists in the public spe space about meat eating. Uh, so I think everyone in this room and most enlightened members of the public appreciate that livestock can have a positive, restorative effect on landscape. You know, li li livestock is a tool. But there's also a lot of evidence to say that excessive meat eating can, you know, and the fact that two-thirds of our cropland goes towards feed has a, has, a, has a negative impact. You know, that's, you could call that commodity beef. <laughs> so the reasonable, reasonable person would uh, conclude that we need to, you know, uh, eat less but better beef. Uh, but that sort of message, that nuanced message, I think is lost a little bit. And it's just, it, it's become like, don't eat meat, veganism will save the world. 
So can you give us some advice on sort of telling that story, that nuanced story, in a, in a sort of simple way, and bear in mind that not everyone, you know, three things, not all members of the public don't have the intellectual sort of bandwidth for holistic, complex systems thinking. You know, there, all, there is also the attention def, you know, deficit thing. You know, you've only got a little bit of attention for the public. And also implicit, I think, in that, you know, less but better, we have to pay more for our meat. So can you give us some advice on communicating those messages to the public? <laughs> Come on, you've got to be first one time, Charlie. <laughs> How to wade into the uh, quagmire, I, I, I mean, it's a good question, and it's one we need to address. The first point I'd make, which Alan made to, again today, is that if we go, are going to reverse desertification, there's really only one way to do it, and that's with, with well-managed livestock in and holistic sense. So that's point one, and that's hugely powerful. And as I've said yesterday, animals in both cropping and grazing systems have the best solutions to both pulling carbon out and impacting human health in a major way. So my second comment would be that people's personal eating preferences is entirely their own decision. So I'm not going to pass judgment on with you're a vegan or something. As someone who has a little bit of an understanding about evolutionary biology and, and that sort of thing, I would say, however, be cautious because we, we co-evolved over that critical million years to eat meat. Um, which comes off animals who graze not just grassland, but grasslands with shrubs in it. And if you look at the work of Fred Provenza, there's tens of thousands of phytochemicals in those plants that... So both for those grass nutrients and the vegetables from the gathering, we are hardwired in our systems, physiologically immune function, to have those things. So it, it seems to me a bit crazy to exclude them. So you're going to exclude things like heme iron, that, it comes from a ruminant animal that ten, is 10 times more absorbable, etc. The other side of this debate is that if we exclude meats, we're going to look at GM soy, which is hugely destructive, both um, given the chemicals in it, etc., of our microbiome, but environmentally, chemically, etc., uh, etc. Et so I, I don't think. There's been no depth of thinking in thinking through beyond the emotion and, and maybe a bit of a fad in some cases of the huge alternate consequences if we take this extreme view. And I'm always a bit sceptical of polarised views anyway. But um, so you, as you can see, I think uh, what Alan referred to, the feedlots, the CAFOs, as uh, concentrated animal feedlots, as Michael Pollan calls them, I think they're unconscionable. Um, we, and it's, it's, it's a weak point of the livestock industry uh, for all sorts of reasons, not just the corn and the soy and everything that goes into it off those landscapes, but the animal behaviour or cruelty and the methane going up out of the ponds and all that. So it's something I think as an industry we need to, to confront. But to go down a, a narrow reductionist view of excluding something we are co-evolved for and the earth needs desperately, to me doesn't make sense. That would be my view. I think all this talk about you know vegans and eating less meat, etc. These again are symptoms of our present reductionist management, ecological uh, ignorance of it. In North America, there are apparently eleven large mammal species, and people keep talking about the millions of bison. The, the, that is not what I'm talking about, or what I talked about yesterday or today. I'm talking about the period before that, before humans got fire and killed off nearly all the animals. Those millions of bison were a remnant. There used to be 40 more large mammal species. Australia, you killed off 86%, I think, or 80-something percent of the large mammals were killed off in Australia. South America was the highest, I think it was 86% of the megafauna was killed off. This world, when these soils and so on developed, was very different from anything we can even imagine today. If I just take Divangombi, the ranch I showed you this morning, I showed you the national parks with bare ground, bare ground, and then I showed you ours. You saw it green and looking like that. That's after 16 bad years in a row since I saw mushrooms, since I saw flame lily, our national flower, this year was our lowest rainfall 
that any of us have ever had, and you saw that result. When I bought that ranch many years ago, there were no elephants, there were no buffalo, they were fenced off by a veterinary fence. The rancher that I bought it from was going broke with a hundred head of cattle. He was a bad rancher, he could probably have run 200 or more. Okay, we have got that result simply by increasing the livestock to 500 head of cattle. We went up to 700 goats as well. We had to cut back on that because they, they can't take the wet weather when we get it. And so we've produced that result. We now have no option but to go up to 1,000 head of cattle on that land. And now on any given day, we can have up to 300 to 500 buffalo as well, and anywhere up to 500 elephants on some days. So I'm describing an incredible pre production. We are battling now to keep pace with the production of the land as it begins to reflect what must have been in the past. And if you come to that land, you're going to find lots of our land in pathetic condition still. Pathetic, how little progress we've made. Most of our progress has been on the deeper soils. So what I'm saying to you, and what I've been saying yesterday, and what I showed you in that picture from NASA, I think certain beliefs of ours are right, that we are overfishing the oceans. We're over-exploiting the oceans. I don't think there's any doubt of that. I think we're over-exploiting the green areas of the world, the tropical forests, etc. But when you look at the two-thirds of the world's land surface that is um, brittle environment, the main thing leading to desertification is underuse, overrest. So when you put that together and what I've just said, the political significance of that, the economic significance of that, the military significance of that is just mind-boggling. But we cannot get through to any military academy, think tank that's dealing with guerrilla warfare these days and recruitment to dissident organizations. We cannot get through to insurance companies who are carrying all these institutions. Uh, it's just paradigm paralysis. We've got to get through and break through with policy. And once one policy changes, I believe it'll be a ripple effect around the world. We will begin to tackle these things seriously. I often use the analogy with the Wright brothers. Before the Wright brothers, learnt how to fly, we had nobody we could blame. On a given day, they learnt how to fly. They gave us the principles of flight. Curved wing, ailerons, power source. Within 70 years, we were on the moon. We haven't known what was causing desertification and climate change. We discovered what was causing it in 84. Think of it like Wright brothers learning to fly. You've only got to get the principles right and now start developing on those principles and the human spirit will fly. But we've got to get that going. I wonder if I could just add to the point Alan was making about our loss of megafauna, which the last big die-off was 45, 50,000 years ago, most likely overuse of fire and predation of slow-breeding animals by our indigenous people. And so, because uh, at that time we had giant marsupial wombats, which are a bit like your badger, but if you can imagine an elephant-sized badger. Uh, and they were the ones that were wiped out. And, and so th that's 100 kilos of dung per day by those animals. So the, the level of nutrient cycling, and we knew from browse height of existing shrubs, which were adapted to a high browse line, was, was, was extensive. And then they were wiped out within a matter of a few thousand years. So the level of ecological function and cycling went way down. That is now being turned around by the only method which is proper holistic raise management of cattle. The, the level of that cycling and recycling of nutrients and the function has now gone up again. So that's the significance of this addressing of desertification process uh, of this sort of um, HM approach. Thank you. I th we'll just have one more question. I'm quite conscious of the time. So, um, just a really quick yeah. question. A really quick question. There are many very good farmers here selling directly to consumers. Charles and Alan, do you both have a good message or quote from each of you?
for them to put on their websites to tell the consumers what you feel they need to know about the great work they're doing or the, the, movement, the movement? Uh, I would just say, uh, talk to Christopher there, right next to you, about the land to market program and uh, consumers beginning to support positive results on the land with their buying dollars. That's the only thing I can think of off the top of my little head. And my comment would be what I made yesterday, that if people buy food off healthy landscape processes through these sort of farming systems, they will deliver and solve a lot of the modern health issues of our society as well addressing some big planetary issues. So it's one hell of a story when it's done right. Well, Charles and Alan, I think that leaves me to say thank you very much for your time, honesty uh, and openness with us. Um, it's been fantastic to sort of delve a bit more into some of the, the details that we, you've both spoken about um, over the last two days and it's been really, really useful just to to pry into that a bit more today. So thank you very much. Thank you, Tim, and thank you all. <laughs>